Thank you. Okay, hello everyone, welcome back. Um, for the next, how much is it? Well, until 12.30 CET, we will now be talking about the code documentation. My name is Samantha. I'm a PhD student at Aalto University in Finland, and I will be doing this together with Radwan, who you already know. And um, we'll be going through the documentation lesson. You have the link in the HackMD. And um, we will learn how to generate different types of documentation and what are the benefits and disadvantages of some of them. Um, we will be, in this case, independent of programming languages, so no Python or any knowledge required. Um, and we will also demonstrate how to make your documentation public, for example. Um, so we'll start with motivation and wish list. And there I would like to ask you to go to the HackMD and think a little bit about why you think um, the documentation of your project code is important. Um, why would you want uh, code that you find on GitHub, for example, to have documentation? Or also, what is your motivation yourself to write um, documentation? And if someone could add that to the HackMD and... Yes, Thank I'm you. working on it. Now we can go through it. I'll give you a few moments. So I can also think from from your own perspective, why do you want to add documentation to your code? We saw in the pre-workshop survey that many of you were interested in this lesson. Why are you interested? You seem to know that it's important. So it's the three questions on top, right? Why documenting code, these ones? Right. Just that I copied the right ones for it. Yes. So why do you think documentation is important? How would you describe a useful documentation? How would you motivate your colleagues to document code? And I will share the HackMD here as well to see what has been writing, written here. Reproducibility is, yes, yes, to be able to understand the process in the future and by others, right? And in the future, again, we talked about this yesterday already in the future, uh, you're, you're, you yourself might want to like recap what you have been doing and why you have been doing these things and others as well. Yeah, so motivating colleague can also be, how would you motivate your, your younger self <laughs> if you could travel back in time? Oh yeah, that would be great. <laughs> Reusable, yes, exactly that. When someone else finds your code somewhere on GitHub, it's good to tell them a little bit what it's about, how to use it, what you maybe need for requirements to run it. Everything clear, short, simple, clear, complete, yeah. I wish I knew, yeah. Sometimes hard to, to motivate others also to contribute to the documentation or to actually write one. I guess there's lots of projects also on GitHub that maybe do not have any documentation, maybe because someone forgot, maybe someone is not interested and someone knows what is going on. Yeah, I, th I see a lot of good things here in the HackMD, yeah. so. I'm going to uh, go back here, see what we have also written down here. 
So yeah, we have seen like this to understand in the future, because especially details one might forget the re reusability issue or aspect. Um, for contribution, definitely someone needs to understand what you have been doing so far to be able to contribute. And also like as researchers writing code, uh, we are, we are all the time busy like doing research. Uh, so it's a good way to just avoid all the emails that might come to ask you like rather simple things that you could have just written in a documentation. So you can kind of shield your limited time there a bit as well. Did you see anything in the HackMD that I should mention here as well, Radovan? Yeah, lots of good, good things. And maybe it was mentioned installation instructions, examples, or like usage example, or copy pasteable examples. That's oh, yeah. really so useful. And and when we work with the project, ten hours a day for many days a week, it's completely clear to us how to run it. But uh, it's not clear at all uh, for those who want to try it out. And maybe they don't. Maybe they don't want to spend two days reading up like very detailed documentation, they want to get an example to get started. Right. And that also leads over to like, that documentation can come in many different forms. So it's not like there's no one type that beats all the other types of documentation. But you have to think a little bit, what do you want people to know from, from this documentation that you're writing? We can see in this box here there is for example tutorials how to guides ex just a explanation or um, also a reference and all these four are like either learning or goal or understanding or information ori oriented and um, one documentation might not have to include all of them but like you have to see what what you would want people to get out of it and yeah, there's really no one size fits all. We will see like a lot of different ways how one can approach this documentation topic. But um, one thing that we will also want you to take away from this that for many small projects, really this readme.md, for example, that GitHub already suggests you when you create, create a repository can be enough and uh, there's there's no no need to go into like all the fancy tools that exist around there and there exist a lot of them. Um, then I'd like to show one example of uh, of a documentation. Uh, you can find a few more here on the lesson material, and I want to show you uh, this one. So as I said, like the documentation can come in many different forms. And this is, for example, one of them. We can see up here. I hope you can see that as well. Um, this one has different versions. You can choose which version uh, of the documentation you want to look at. And the version then also is like linked to the version of the code. Um, there's installation instructions mentioned here. We have like the basic documentation. And we also saw in the beginning that, for example, here we have tutorials. So probably some walkthrough through the code, how, how it can be used in like very general uh, examples. And I, I highly recommend to look through these examples that we have here and also take a look at um, the pros and cons that we have written down here for these examples and maybe you have your own your own ideas what you like about them and maybe you can get some ideas for your for your own uh, documentation and um, so maybe now we can go back again to the hackmd and uh, maybe you take a moment to look at these examples and see what what do you like about them what what do you want uh, in a documentation, what do you what do you need as a user when you when you look at documentation? So let's create a wish list um, together. 
also think about when you have been looking at documentations uh, that you didn't like, what were you missing on why do you think that that would have been important to mention? There is a comment that your top of your screen is not really visible. Okay. Um, but at least for me, it's the only thing I don't see are the tabs of the browser, which maybe we are not supposed to see. So no, those you don't need to see. Yeah. But I'll try to move it a bit more down when yeah. I'm showing something up there. Thanks. Yes, yeah, so it's on the bottom of the hack and D. It's to create a wish list. And some of these points have been already mentioned, like how we describe a useful documentation. But this is really like when you visit a new project or what are you looking, looking for? What, what are you enjoying when it's there? And this is then also for you when you, like after this workshop, you may be in the situation that you have to start writing or you want to start writing, hopefully a documentation for your own code. And we, we will publish this HackMD as usual on the, on the web page. So you can come back, revisit and then go through these points or also go through the lesson material. We have the solution tab there uh, and check that you have everything, yeah. everything included that people would like to see because uh, it's and good to ask say, others. Yeah. And don't hesitate to um, maybe ping some of us for code review. Like you have a change on GitHub and you would like to get feedback. I mean, I wouldn't mind so ping me there. Yeah, and it might also be good to, when you are done with your documentation, to just give the package of your code and the documentation to one of your colleagues or a friend, and without telling them anything, just let them try to run your code. And then you see very, very fast, like if your documentation is good enough for someone unfamiliar with what you have been doing to, to use the code showing examples, installation instructions, yes. Uh, we can also show a little bit here what we have been writing down as in the example that we showed, the versions are very good uh, to connect to the versions of your code as well, because something might change in your code and then you also need to update your documentation. Documentation should be close, close to the source code um, we suggest to use a standard markup language, in that case, meaning something um, that can be read by human, even if it's not rendered. We have been using this already now in this uh, HackMD document. There we use Markdown, so you have been uh, or practicing it already. And we will see uh, restructured text uh, RST uh, later in this, in this episode. Copy pasteable, like um, some may want to write their documentation with LaTeX, for example, which then creates a PDF, which sometimes can be very difficult to, to copy paste an example into your terminal. Installation instructions I've seen on the Hackamni as well, yeah. License and the information for contributors. I see most of you have already a very good idea on what what you would like to have in the documentation. And you can go here in the lesson material, there are some good resources um, to look at if you want to, want to write your own documentation and what to look at. And uh, as I said, the wish list is also good to refer to later. And now I want to just um, show you some popular tools that uh, you can, can or and solutions that you can uh, look at when you come to the point that you want to write a documentation. Um, there is, for example, the encode documentation. So you, you write comments to your functions or to your scripts. 
Um, for other programmers, this is very good because they are anywhere in your anyway in your code, so they can see then right away what happens. And um, but for users that only want to use your tool or your code, um, they might not want to look into the into the source code of your project. They would rather have something separate from that. And therefore, README files, for example, uh, are a good way to add like an overview of everything, you know, of why the why the code exists, what it's for, how it's used. I can also add here that uh, for these sections like e-code documentation, we have an extra episode on that, which uh, in fact, the in-code documentation we will not really practice, but there is an episode in this lesson. For the readme files, we have an episode. In that one, we will, we will go into. Oh, uh, yeah, I just want to point it out. And also on restructure text and markdown that uh, Samantha will go into now, we will have then follow up episodes. Right. So, yeah, as, managed, so, uh, as mentioned, uh, the restructure text we will we'll practice in a bit with the uh, Sphinx. And Markdown, you have already been practicing in the HackMD. And here's a, an example of how, how they are um, written, how they are used, how the raw, um, raw files look. And uh, you can also take a look at these links that we provided here. And there's also tools to convert between Markdown and RST, for example, this Pandoc tool. And later we will actually practice RSD. So that's the one, if you scroll a little bit up, that's the one to the right panel. Uh, so this one we will test out. And these two are really maybe one of the most standard markup languages, not only for readme's, but also as we later will see, uh, we can generate websites out of that. And I think we are not saying that the one is the better than the other, but I think it's good to know that both exist and different communities and different tools will prefer the one or the other. Right, and they have slightly different syntax, mm -hmm. um, but there is like websites showing this syntax on one pages where it, that you can just have open when you're writing uh, documentation in either one. Um, then uh, down here is a list of uh, HTML static site generators meaning we can write, for example, in Markdown or RST, then we run this tool and we get out the HTML page. And you can take a look at these, these links here as well. Uh, we will be practicing Sphinx uh, with, together with RST, but I will also show um, later the, that this lesson material is actually um, also built with Sphinx and you can take a look at that. Then there's also wikis, or uh, as mentioned already, lattes or PDFs that can be used for code documentation. Um, and um, during the last days, there was already some mention of, of Doxygen in the HackMD. That's also a tool that can be, can be used to auto-generate the API documentation for your code. And also for there's language specific tools that you can find down here. But this should just give you a short overview of what there is. And uh, once you get into that, you want to start writing a documentation, you can revisit this lesson material, click on the links, uh, check it out a little bit and like do what feels best at the moment. And now uh, Radovan will go over to the readme files yes. or encode documentation first. So just a sec, let me I'll take the screen here. And I have it. And before moving on, I wanted to say thanks here for the many good comments on on this wish list of how documentation should be. Such a great points. I think I want to highlight a few of them again. So it's how to install example, have an example version. Documentation should be versioned. And we we saw that in this nice example from the tool that Samantha demonstrated that we can then get documentation for each published version. Because that's important because the code is evolving. And for reproducibility, so one of one of the strongest requirements 
is that the documentation should go with the code. It, it should be actually in the same Git repository because only then we can have the same versions. Uh, also, what I really liked here, thought process. Like what were the design choices in the code? Why did, why did we do this and not that? Because also that gets often forgotten and, and often reinvented later. Also plain English description of what's going on. So not only code documentation about the code itself, but, but again, like more high level accessible. It's really about accessibility. Good, thanks so much. And now I will move on to, uh, to so we have now talked briefly motivation, popular tools, quick overview, pros and cons. Um, I will not talk about in-code documentation, but I want you to know that it exists there. Again, it's really good to have, but it's probably not sufficient because the user of the code may not want to go into the code and read the source code. They may just want to use it. They may not have access to the source code even. We want to know before the break, which will be about in 22 minutes, <clears throat> we want to talk about readme files. So we're going to this episode here. And zooming in. So quick recap is that what we often see on GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket is that projects often have either readme.md and then it's in Markdown or they have readme.rsd and then it's in restructured text. And a quick recap what these two are. So it's one of, one of these two here. So on the left side Markdown, this is what we have been writing in the HackMD all the time. Uh, restructured text is very popular in the Python community, but many tools, you can use both of them. One tool that we will focus on today later is Sphinx. Sphinx is the tool that actually built this lesson. So this lesson underneath is, in fact, it's Markdown. And we will later show you really how the lesson looks under the hood and how it's rendered so that you can see really the but what we are looking here is the rendered HTML. But for many projects, let me navigate to the readme files. Here we are. For many projects, a readme file is actually absolutely good, good enough. Only if it grows really, really lengthy. Um, so I, I often start with a readme file. And then if I grow out of it, then I go to Sphinx or some other tools. And How do you decide when you grow out of it? I think when it becomes, okay, good, really good question. So first, when, when it becomes a bit difficult to navigate and when, and about navigation, I should scroll down and mention that you can add table of contents to your readme, which can be really useful. And here are hints how to do that in RST and in Markdown or GitLab, you can do it like that and the GitHub inserts table of contents. But once it gets a bit difficult to navigate, and also once I want to have several versions listed on the same page, the same way in the demo, in the example that you showed, then I go for something else. Yep. And here we can, so we thought of sending you soon in a breakout room, but before let me explain. Here we have several options because we know that not everybody here is into the Python language. So the exercise one is a Python project that somebody else wrote that you can discuss. And the goal is here of this exercise is to um, really improve a readme to discuss what should be in, your, in what should be in the readme. But instead of using this Python example, you can also alternatively, you can exercise two, you can draft a readme if you don't have one or review a readme for one of your own projects. 
So this can then happen in the group. You can screen share, you can discuss. So it can be really, a, this is a discussion exercise. And please take notes in the HackMD so that because then everybody can benefit. So you can review, discuss one of your projects. If you don't have an own project yet, no problem. Then you can also take one of the, a library or a project or a code that you have recently used. And you can discuss the readme of that other project. And of course, let's do that very constructively. So we will not, we will be very respectfully criticize, but let's very respectfully, constructively critique how we can improve readme's of other projects. And our goal is to, to come up with, well, here's a suggestion, but it doesn't have to be this way. Uh, what should be in the readme, how we can improve it for better reusability, better accessibility. And you can choose here one of these three. Is that, did I forget anything? So please keep notes in the document. Uh, we thought of giving you 15 minutes, which would be almost then to the half an hour, we would then summarize. And after that, we will go into a break. So let's open the rooms, 15 minutes. And then we can also have a discussion here then on stream. So I will show first example, which is not too bad. Maybe I will also come up with examples that can be improved. So here's a code of mine, which is written in README RSD, documented in README RSD. There is a table of contents, which I found, find useful so that I can jump to these things. The table of contents is, and also some tabs here, DOI. And in the table of contents, let's have a look here. So I, I try to credit people who have contributed, how, how it should be cited. What is have not- Have you gotten any citations? Oh, this one. Mm, let's have a look. <laughs> I don't know, but let's have a look whether it has been, what is, I think Zenodo used to do that, used to list them. Let's see what it will tell me. Well, at least a couple of views and downloads. I I should also count the citations. Uh, I don't know. Oh, here, yeah, maybe I can do it. One literature. Okay. Oh, there is, okay, somebody cited me, all right. So there's one citation, cool. Um, so it helps. So it yes. helps you edit how to yeah. say it. <laughs> so it will take time to have them, but I think it will. It, after a couple of years, it's a nice metric. What is missing here is code of conduct. I, sh I should add that. I don't have it. And yeah, so that will be good to do. And then I try to put what what are the dependencies, requirements, how to install it with pip. So it's a one line thing. Then API, and maybe that's not a great name because only people who know what that means know what that means. But oh, like changes, units, an example so that, that I'm happy about that this is here and then some more breakout info on. So the example is that you can copy paste this and it will run and, and to the people in the community, it will make some sense what is happening here. Still a bit lengthy. Yeah, so that's a pretty okay example. You can also check on the uh, insights if you own the repository, what's still missing from your, um, what GitHub recommends. So if you scroll up to the, um, place those three dots in at the end. So insights, insights, insights. And then? On the community tab. Oh, here we go, yes. Community. Oh yeah. There's, there's a list of things that GitHub recommends what to have there in order for the repository to be um, more, well, not more adopter friendly, yeah. I would say. 
in the in the sense that um, these will help new and existing contributors better uh, work with, uh, with the project. They're not necessary, but they offer quite a good insight. And there's even sometimes if you have a enable security checks here and how to do a security policy mm -hmm. on your um, repository. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the contributing guidelines is actually quite something that I recommend putting because it's something that people will look first when they start uh, working with the repo. Yes, so that is missing. We can have templates for issues and pull requests. I didn't add them because I'm not so sure I actually like them because they they make it more formal, but to me also they can actually add a barrier. So they can be helpful, but they can also be a bit very formal. I, at, at this size of the project, I like to just have them free form. If it really becomes a problem, I will make forms for them. Yes, that's very, very good, as you said. And it says at the, at the top, here are some project compares to recommended community standards. So it's recommended, it's not necessary. Mm -hmm. But I can see your point about being too formal. So Yeah. Any other project you can show? Samantha, do you have a project that we could look at or got no pressure? I can't. I can show another one which actually uses Sphinx. So here, this grew a bit too long for README. And then the README I keep very, very short. But I then refer to the documentation and read the docs. I find it also useful to have this change log. I mean, people who use it, and they don't follow all the changes, but they want to know just what changed from last time they looked at it from one year ago, so they can have a look at the change log. And then uh, the actual documentation is on read the docs, which we will see then a bit later. And here I can have, well, sections and it, it got a bit too much for readme. Also really nice about Sphinx and read the docs is that maybe this goes a bit, but I can, download a PDF version of the documentation if I want to. And then here I chose to have two versions documented. One is the stable one and one is the latest one. So people can compare. And these are different branches on GitHub. I'd have one example. I send it to you in Zoom chat. Oh yeah. Okay. How are we doing with the exercise? How long does it go? Did we not? Uh, looks good, people are writing. Until 28. Working on the exercises. Yeah. So here I have your example open. Yes, so it was uh, um, something that I was writing for uh, our National Research Institute. And I also used Sphinx for the documentation. When you click on the link, you should be, hopefully, I did not check. No, uh, link oh, to great. Yeah. read the docs. So we have like a general description in the beginning, uh, what what this uh, code is for, what you can do with it, and uh, how it was funded. And then some uh, preparation, mm -hmm. uh, what you need to do the Conda environment is set up, what libraries are used. Um, oh yeah, nice. Basic usage example. So the project comes with its own environment demo, right? Yeah. And that's, that's really nice. So it's here somewhere. Um, in the Python, I think. Yeah, here. So that's great because then I know how to, if I want to use it or contribute to it, then I can create this environment. All right, and uh, we we in our in the Geo community we very often use Anaconda for this because mm -hmm. many of the libraries do not work well together in certain yeah. versions, so it's good to uh, fix those. And then like also some troubleshooting we added because I noticed when testing this that there's some common common uh, errors that confuse users because there's then from other from mm -hmm. other libraries coming some really cryptic error messages or something. 
Oh, right, right, because you depend on these many libraries and sometimes the libraries throw these. Yeah. Yeah, an example. Great. How to, like one really full work walkthrough mm -hmm. of how to use the code. But it's a very specific code, so I, like we did not really expect anyone to, to ever find it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I mean, people find it, so... I have these most obscure with projects and still they get found sooner or later. Yeah. And it's useful for somebody. And in this case, it was nice because it was a requirement to have a documentation and to have an example uh, from the funding uh, place in oh, Eurostat okay. in this case. Did so, they also require that it's open source? Uh, yes. Hmm. That's a nice change to because it, it was also discussed in the in the earlier discussion exercise that like how to motivate us to document and I think we should maybe change a bit our approach that documentation is part of coding I mean when you write code documentation is part of it yeah. and if the documentation is missing then it's not really complete and it's not really usable and from but, the beginning yeah. I think like I yeah. had the problem in the beginning that I was thinking ah, it will anyway change so much I do not start writing it yet but now I wish I had, because some things I d just don't remember why I did it that way. And if I had written it down right away, then it would be much easier now to create this document for the code. Yes, and it's it's like never a really good time. There are always deadlines, and we often say that well, we will document it in three weeks when things calm down, but they never calm down. And then it can get postponed forever. Yeah, and I think sometimes it's also the problem that from the supervisors, you don't get time maybe to to spend time on writing documentation because it's not the research. It does not like contribute to what else you have to do and yeah. it might be hard to get time. But in terms of reusability, it might be actually one of the most important things like for the, for the next PhD student, for the next postdoc, if they want to pick it up. If the documentation is not there, I mean, it's a huge time will be wasted. And maybe we can make it part of our code review. So when we review code, we also review this documentation part of it and make it part of our work. But but as you said, I mean, it, can, it also needs to be a bit credited and recognized from our like management. Right. One thing which I think is uh, rather useful is that one make tutorial material for examples which are part of the active research projects so that people mm -hmm. if they find a preprint or, or a published paper mm -hmm. then they have what they need to uh, redo the calculations with the, the program in question yeah that's wonderful to have really like a real example still short but real so not like full bar hello world but um, instead an actual real tutorial and yeah. that is not only good for like you, the users that we don't know yet, but it's also good for new, the new student joining the group. Then first thing that can, they can do is to go through these tutorials. Yes. And they will learn how to use the code. They will learn a bit the methodology and they can even then find out problems in the documentation or things that are unclear and help improve these tutorials. And that's great onboarding. Yeah, I agree. And also it's, it's good for the purpose of reproducibility. Mm -hmm. of uh, research findings because then people I mean in, inside the group or also outside the group can get going with redoing calculations I mean I, either the very same or, or similar mm -hmm. ones yes. let's see how the rooms are going because I think we have two minutes left I think it will be Maybe okay discussions some suggestions to what to put in a Read me file. Yeah, so my plan is that when we are back, we will summarize a bit this part. Maybe we can erase some of the good points that were raised here during on stream. And then there would be a like a 10 minute break then. Yep. And then we are perfectly on plan. Yep. Sounds good. Thanks a lot. Welcome back. Thanks for your notes. If uh, 
I can also imagine that a lot a lot was said and not written, but like please note them down here. It will be really interesting to see. And some of the points we also have listed here in a in our material. So descriptive project title, motivation, why the project exists. It's clear to me when I work on it many, many hours, but it may not be clear at all to those visiting the page how to install, how to set up. It's nice to have a quick code example to get started, a recommended citation. Then what we did here on the stream during the breakout room is we discussed some of our own projects. So if you are interested, it will be then on the, on the recording. So we looked at uh, two projects of mine. We looked at a project of Samantha's. We discussed what we like, what is missing. One great suggestion that came up was to also include tutorials as part of the readme or documentation. These can be great because these are better examples than like a full bar, hello world, to have a, like a real example as a tutor tutorial. This can be also great for new students joining the group or to get them started for onboarding because then they can get used to the methodology, get used to the code. They can help improving the documentation. And also mentioned in the HackMD that there was a missing sample of the data. So in the tutorials, there can also be sample of the data so that mm -hmm. the user can look at this data file and actually then uh, like rearrange their own files to look the same to make sure the code works on them. And also the input and output should be described in the documentation. Because that's often at least how I work. I take an example, I try to make it work. If it works, then I try to adapt it to my own example, to my own data. And then I tweak it until I'm happy. Uh, and this should be, it's good if this is easy or yeah, at least can, possible. It can only be done if you know like how the input should look like yeah. to be able to adjust it. I mean, there's many different formats, many yeah. different ways how a CSV file, for example, could look. And it can be frustrating if it's not so easy. And if I have to like read a lot and go deep into the code to find out how to even run it. Thanks so much for your notes. We suggest a 10 minute break. After the break, we will then talk about, we will take it to the next level and we will talk about Sphinx. So let me put here into the HackMD that we have break until 41 past. Okay, welcome back everyone. Hope you had a good break. Good time to relax. Um, we will now continue to Sphinx. So we have mentioned it already. Sphinx is one of the static site generators that uh, in its original state, let's say, uh, uses the restructured text format. And we also told you already that this lesson material that you are looking at here now on my screen is actually written in Sphinx. So Sphinx can be used not only for your documentation, but also for, for example, the lesson material. And when we take a look at the source code here, this is now the source code of the lesson material. Here I have one note for you. So I said we will be using Sphinx with uh, in RST with the restructured text format. Our lesson material is written in Markdown. So Sphinx is not only for um, restructured text, that's just like the original idea, I guess. Um, but you can also use Markdown for it. And there's, um, for example, the MIST, my ST parser that can be used um, to, to do that. So we can see here, uh, like it's the, the, raw, the raw, raw lesson um, you can actually read as a human. It's not like, for example, what uh, Radovan showed before, like the JSON for, for also HTML can be really, really tricky to just like get the idea what's the content of the website. Um, and then internally what Sphinx does, it is it takes this in this case, markdown file and converts it to the HTML so that we get back 
to the or that we get um, to this format. Um, so yeah, we can see here, uh, similar to what we have been using in HackMD, we have headers marked by this, then some uh, notation for these boxes that we have here, the objective boxes, for example, can create different levels of headers. And uh, we will be practicing uh, the same just with RST format. Um, and we will be going into breakout rooms soon. But before we decided to do the, the first part as a type along. So uh, if you would all uh, open your own terminal and... Um, and I can add here that oh, now we don't want to be in the same folder as the Jupyter. So if you are still in some Jupyter folder from previous lesson, then I think we want to go out of it, create a new folder for this lesson. Right, uh, and we will be creating this, the folder together even. Um, so I wrote in the HackMD before already uh, that please make sure that you have the Sphinx and Sphinx build uh, installed. It came with the code refinery environment file. So let's see that I move this out and move this in. So I hope you can see my terminal now. So the first thing we want to do, because we have the Sphinx in the Conda environment, we want to activate. Conda activate code refinery or whatever you called it. Probably most of you have it called code refinery. Um, if you don't remember what you have called it, you can do Conda nth list to see what kind of environments you have created and there you will probably then be reminded of the name that you have given it. Uh, I know that it's going to activate code refinery in this case. Okay, now I'm in the in the environment. And there uh, I can see that, for example, Sphinx build version is there. So if it shows you a version, everything is fine. It's and if the version is, yeah, happen. right. If it's slightly different, it's not no problem. Yeah. So you don't need exactly this, this version. Um, but something should be shown there. So um, what we want to do first now is we want to create a new, um, a new directory where we will put all the documentation that we're going to write now. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually uh, create documentation that uh, is for us to play around for now, but like the same way you would start if you want to create uh, documentation for your code with Sphinx later on. So we want to put it into a separate folder. So we use mkdir for creating a directory and we call it doc example, just in the, in the place where we are now, or if you have a special place, then you um, move there and create wherever you want to have it. Uh, then we switch into the, um, or we can check that it's there. So here we have now directory called doc example. So we change directory cd into doc example. Now we are in the uh, in the directory, and um, Sphinx has a really nice feature uh, called Sphinx Quick Start. Start writing. Um, and this is, as the, the word already says, it's really a quick start for you. So it helps you to build the general structure that you will need for the Sphinx documentation. And please, as it's a type along exercise, I'll try to be very uh, slow and I will make probably mistakes, which is good and makes it even slower. Um, please let me know if it's going still too, too fast. Uh, then I can adjust that. So it would be good if everyone would follow along with this to create the basic structure of the document, because then you can go into the breakout rooms to uh, actually play around with it more and don't need to spend on time, valuable time of the breakout room for this. So 
things, things quick start. Uh, we run that. And now it tells you welcome, please enter values. Uh, we have already selected the root path, which is here. The dot indicates that we want to have it here in the, in the directory that we just created. Um, then um, it, wants, it asks us if we want to separate the source and the build directories. So as mentioned, things will use the RST files that we will create to create the HTML files that we can then look, look at in our browser. And in this case, it just asks um, if we want to separate those or if we want to have them together. Uh, we will keep them together. It indicates here with the N in the brackets that that's the default. So we press enter using the default so we don't want to separate them. Then we give it a project name, awesome project. Um, that will also be shown in the, in the documentation later and we will take a look at that in a moment. The author name, my name, I have been writing this, this will also then be shown. Then it asks for a project release. And um, I think you usually would start with version 0 0.1, is that right, Dorado? Yeah, or would you start with 1.0? No, I think I, I like 0. Point something. Yeah. Sometimes if it's already a little bit evolved in 0. 0.5, depending on like 1.0, that's already means it's like released and stable somehow. So I will start okay. like that. And because we are right now, we imagine that we are in the beginning of coding our, our stuff as well. So like 0 0.1 is then, is then good. Um, then uh, we chose the project language, we keep it in English now, but you can apparently also choose other languages here. There are supported ones. Um, okay. And now it said, okay, creating file, created some files, finished. Um, and it also already suggests to us that we should populate the master file as it called, is called here, the index.rst file and uh, create other documentation source files. And now we can take a look. Before we uh, newly created this doc example directory, so it was empty. And now what Sphinx has done, it has given us, nice as it is, um, a lot of files and uh, different folders. And we can just take, uh, take a look at this. We have uh, this conf.py, which is the, the basic um, configuration file for for uh, what you what, what what we are building and if you would like to for example change the way your uh, html looks in the end you could go with nano or whatever um, editor you like go into it and there is some comments here tell you something and then here you could also go back and change for example the project name if it's not any more awesome project but very awesome project you could do that here uh, who's the copyright holder the release you can change here there is a lot of extensions that you can use with Sphinx you can use templates for the the build um, and also the the theme the default is this alabaster, but we will also take a look at that uh, in the exercise, I think. Uh, and the HTML static path. So if you would want to add some static files such as images, or if you have, for example, a web map that you would like to add to your page, you could put the HTML of this web map into the static folder and uh, it could be accessed there. Um, then, as Sphinx has already uh, indicated, we will need to, we, we have this index RST file, which we will need to populate with what we want to have. We have a few make files here. 
that we can ignore for now. Um, and templates and the build directory. This is where um, I think now it should be empty. Yeah. So we have not built anything yet. We have not done anything yet um, where our HTML files will be located later. Then, um, let's see. Okay, so it's suggested to edit the index RST file. So let's take a look. We go into nano index.rst. And there is already something there. Um, some awesome pro project documentation master file created by Sphinx Quick Start. And we already see uh, uh, RST speciality feature or however it's called, um, these two dots indicate, in this case, a uh, uh, comment. So this is just for our information that we know what this file is about. Then there is a welcome to awesome projects documentation. Uh, so it already created this for us. A talk tree, so for the table of content. Um, there's a lot of of arguments that you can give it here that you can find on the on the Sphinx uh, website, uh, wh what this um, table of content is called, and some other stuff. So there's not much there, but let's take a look. Or should we should we change it first? Maybe we change it first. So we can basically remove these indices and tables. We don't need that for now. Yes, just to simplify the example. And then exactly. the next thing that we should do is to reference a file in the under the table of content. Exactly. And there it's important um, to keep the indentation. Feature A. So here we name a file. But it's to us to call it however we like. So here we anticipate that we will create a file called feature-a.rsd. And here we tell the table of contents to process it and show the relevant headings in the table of contents. So this file doesn't exist yet. We will create it in a moment. OK. So yes, this is the file that we want to, want to add. And let's control O to save it, control X to exit in nano. And uh, now we need to create that file and put something in it. Well, it would be good because now it's linked in the cable table of contents. Um, yeah. It was called feature-a.rsd. Feature a.rst. So we use nano again to create and edit, go into edit mode for that file. And here it's important that this is the same name as we have given it in, in the index rst. So we go in there, empty, uh, we give it a title, and then we can make this a header by adding um, this equation marks underneath. And what Sphinx wants is that we put the, 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 the equation marks underneath are as long as the title for it to, to take this as a, as a header. We can now also it's one, Now it's one too long, huh? right? Ah, yeah. It's too long, does it matter? I think too long does not matter, but too oh, short okay. matters. OK. We can try this actually. Let's make subsection one too short and this one one too long. Um, then we can have, add some text here that we want to have on this uh, under this subsection. We can have um, bullet points uh, or yeah, what one wants. We can also have nested bullet points here and therefore again indentation is important. 
and also the space after the, uh, the dash is uh, important. Okay. The empty, I read in the HackMD, yes, the empty lines are um, relevant. It, um, for example, if we would put, uh, remove this one, it would not work. It would put um, everything in one line. Um, there's also on the Sphinx website, um, all of these specialities are mentioned, but Sphinx also does a quite good job with telling you what's wrong if something is wrong. Um, okay, so we have added now a header, a subheader, some text here and some bullet points. And we control O, save it, enter to the name feature A minus, uh, feature minus A dot RST, control X to get out of nano. So now we have in our um, doc example directory, the index dot RST and the feature A RST. Um, I think what is important here is that the index RST is on the same level as the feature RST, but you could also move both of them uh, into uh, another directory called content or something. That was the very first step that Sphinx asked us if we want to separate those. Yeah, also the feature A could be in a subfolder, but then in index RST, we would have to say, in the table of contents, we would have to say subfolder slash feature A RST. So they don't, they don't necessarily have to be in the same folder, but then we need to adapt the table of contents. Um, okay, so we have created this. And now what we want to do is we want to actually build our website, our HTML files. In Sphinx, you have this call called Sphinx build, Sphinx minus build. And then we have to tell it from where to where. So we are already in the doc example directory where we created uh, the feature A and the, where there is the index.rst. So we can say current, and we indicate this with the uh, full stop dot. Um, and we wanted to build into the underscore build directory, which is already there uh, that Sphinx has created for us. But we could. I think rename this to anything we want. We just need to tell things uh, from where to where to build. Okay. Um, we click enter. And now, oh no. Now I have the problem that I cannot scroll up here because of the upper. So I cannot see the error. No. Do you know if it's somehow possible to scroll up here in the in the lower Does part? Control B escape and up arrow work. Control. Ah oh, no, control D. I tested this before that did not work for me. That made everything fail. Okay, I'll have to tell you what it says then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Luckily, I know. <laughs> but in your own, in your own, um, uh, on your own computer, you will see something that you can also see in the in the lesson material. And for me, if you remember, we did this test. Uh, what it will complain about, about the too long or too short header and subheader section. So we can take a look at this. So. This, what is in red here, across the, uh, above this line, it will say that like uh, this section header is too short or something like that. So it tells you what's actually wrong. So we go back to the feature minus a dot RST. And we fix this issue. 
and save that. And then we use the up arrow to go back to the Sphinx build command and we run that one again. And now it tells you, okay, it's loading something, it's updating the environment, it's reading the sources, it's preparing the document, writing the output, generating the indices based on what you put in the, in the table of content, uh, copying then the static files, if you had images or other HTML files there. Um, and then it says build succeeded, hopefully. For most of you. And don't worry if this not does not work right away. Um, we will go into breakout rooms real soon and uh, practice this. And um, now we can, depending on which uh, operating system you're on, I'm on Linux, so I use xdg minus open the build directory and the index Dot, oh yeah, I should show that. We can go into the uh, build directory, take a look before it was empty. Now we have a bunch of uh, HTML files there, static directory, sources directory, and some JavaScript that uh, were generated by, by Sphinx for you. And something we forgot to double check, but uh, somebody notes that sort of too long line was not a problem indeed, just the two short line was a problem. Yeah. And Sorry, I could not show that, that it does not tell yeah. anything about it, but yeah. And also here, um, so you use this XDG open, but for other operating system, we have examples in the documentation. So I forgot what it was, but for... Yeah, Mac OS uses open yeah. and Windows users may use start as the keyword. And then you give the build directory, and then the index.html that, so that we see this basic uh, page that you will land on. Oh, I am already in the build directory, so I just need to put index.html. And then let me move this over here. Hopefully what you can see is something like this. So we have now created our very first uh, documentation HTML page using Sphinx by writing it in uh, in RST format. And we can see here the contents key keyword. We had that in our um, index RST. And the feature and also the sub subsection can be, can be seen here. And this is now our, our, on our computer. So for me, it opened the Firefox, um, but the file is still on our computer here. And we can click on some feature A and see what we have put there, bullet points, everything there. And if I want it, so right now it's on our computer. Later, if we have time, we will discuss how to host it somewhere else. So for instance, GitHub pages or read the docs. So we'll show that later. Also, we can change the, the looks. So now it's this, if we can, we can choose a different theming if we want to a different team, then it would look differently. So all that can be customized. Right. And now um, we'll go into breakout rooms. And you can, if you did not manage to, to follow now, sorry if it was a bit too fast, you can find all the commands we used uh, in the exercise one of the lesson material the Sphinx lesson material. And so if you if you want to, you can follow exercise one first and then go over to also doing exercise two where we'll add another feature and take a look at how you can add an image, for example, a link, some table um, or some other file names. So exercise two is uh, what I would like you to look at a little bit no need to go through everything. Just play around a little bit, get familiar with the RST format and try to render your own. Oh, I was not showing this this material, I'm sorry. Um, get familiar with it and render it in between or do, use Sphinx build 
um, in between to see how it looks when you change this. I usually, I write a little bit and then uh, I use things built very often in between to see that everything looks like as I intended. Um, so yeah, f 15 minutes, I guess. Sounds great. So that would be until 23. 23. And yeah, I can also continue here for the stream viewers. Um, so yeah, now we have the exercise two here. So we want to add a uh, feature B with uh, different levels of headers, then some items, numbered lists, for example, tables. We can also add code blocks uh, that are rendered and copyable, copyable, um, with this nice little icon here in the right of the box. Things does that for us. Mm, which is nice then for, for examples that, that you want to add to the documentation. Then uh, we can also have syntax highlighting. We can include uh, other files using this literal include mm, and even include uh, Jupyter notebooks. Yeah, the literal include I like a lot. So it can be any file uh, that can maybe in the same repository. And then instead of duplicating the same file, if I want to talk about it in the documentation, instead of duplicating it in the documentation, I can include it into the documentation. And then with code highlighting, we can also highlight certain lines. So this is a very nice way of avoiding duplicating, diverging our documentation. Um, we go out of the build directory. We're now back where the feature A and index RST are sitting. And it's always good or, well, to, to make sure that you have everything in, in your landing page to add all files to the index RST, either before um, or after. Uh, Sphinx will also tell you if there is RST files that are not included in the table of contents, for example. Uh, so it will say it found a file uh, which is not included anywhere. Um, or if you added it into the index RST but made, for example, a typo, Sphinx will also tell um, that the file cannot be found. It will not tell you that you made a typo, but it will tell you that uh, it cannot be found that way. So first we go into the into the index RST. We add here feature B dot RST. And here it's really the links to the files. What is then um, rendered actually here in the website that uh, we created in the table of contents that is shown here on the left is the header of the file that is linked there. So you can change that by changing the header of the file. Um, feature B, okay, saving that. Uh, going out of nano again, and then we create and go into editing the feature b.rst. And here, yeah, so we can have different levels of headings. Um, we can have hello one. This is the first level of heading in Markdown that's uh, like in HackMD, it would be like this just as a side note. And then the next heading would be hello to, it's the dashes. And then there goes many more 
uh, that you can find in the Sphinx, Sphinx documentation. Um, we can add, for example, a link if we wanted to uh, link to, to somewhere to like the GitHub repository or some other, maybe the website of a dependency or something, we can do that also uh, by using this, I don't know what it's called, uh, sign. Um, and then we, get, we give here the text that we want to display have displayed on our web page, and then where it shall lead. And in this case, we just put click here and we link to Google. And then it needs another one of these and an underscore. And this will, we'll take a look at that in a moment, will uh, show us click here as this blue marked um, link on the web page and it will link us to Google. Then we can have similar to the bullet points, we can have the numbered lists and there we can either have like this, we, we give them the numbers directly or we can also use the hash for uh, um, giving the numbers automatically. So we can go on here. Oh, two comes first. And funky that it gives it now a different number, but I guess it thinks this is a comment or something. Nano right now. Um, then now uh, we could add a table as shown here. So we give it uh, a line on top, then the headers of the table, another line, and then the content of the table. That's nice for, for smaller tables, but probably good to think of something else if you have bigger tables to, to put. Uh, what I would like to add here is a code blog. So here we have a code block to show you how that is rendered. And here we give two um, wow, words, double points. <laughs> what is it called in English? Colon? Colon, yeah. Yeah, colon. Um, to indicate that we are now starting a, a code block and then again, one empty line and indentation to let Sphinx know that we're now giving what we want to have in the code block. So we want to, for example, uh, say something about a certain function that is called hello. Um, in this case, a Python function, if like it's not um, if we just want to sh show something based on that or highlight um, a specific part of a function that we also have in our code, but we want to have it in the documentation. A world. Yeah. And let's save this now. Control O and enter feature minus B dot RST looks fine. We exit nano and um, now we go back up arrow to get back to the Sphinx build command that we used before. Sphinx minus build in this same location. We are in the doc example directory and we want to build into the underscore build directory. And we run that. And luckily there is no error. So now it rebuilt the HTML files. So they have now changed. We can check in the build directory. Before we had only 
feature A dot HTML. Now we also have feature B HTML and index dot HTML will probably also have changed. Um, then we can go back to using the XDG open in my case or the open or the, what's the other one? Uh, start, depending on your operating system to take a look at the index HTML. If you have it open, you can also uh, refresh up here to reload the current page, then it will update. And I can add here that, well, I don't remember sometimes how to open it from the terminal, but what I didn't know, if I know the folder path, then I can put the path directly into the browser and oh, sometimes yeah. I open it up directly there if I know where it is. Yeah, or for the clickers, we can also go into the into our um, file explorer, find the file there in the build directory and click that one to open it in the, the browser. So now we have, uh, well, we did not give it some feature B as a header. So we will see, we see here now hello one because that is the one header that we put in there. Um, we have it here in the middle in the table of contents and we have the table of contents also here on the left. You can click that to get here. We have this uh, <laughs> um, very mysterious click here link, uh, which would link us to Google. We have the numbered lists now with uh, automatically added three and four. If you remember, we had uh, not put the numbers directly here and the code block and how it is. Rendered. Can we try uh, to also change the theme? Yes, oh yeah, that's a good idea. We have like two minutes left now before Excel is okay. over, so we would. So for changing the team, theme, we would go back here where we have the conf.py. We go into conf.py, go all the way down, I think, there, HTML theme. There's a nice website, uh, if you Google Sphinx themes, I think, uh, with examples on how, how they look. And what we would like to have now is the Sphinx RTD, meaning read the docs. So that yes, because then it will look exactly like on read the docs, which we will mention a bit later. Yeah, so we change that here, just the name and save that into conf. And then we need to rebuild. Um, oops. Uh, rebuild into the build and reopen this the oh. build and now uh, sometimes it might be that you have to reload uh, now we see it looks a bit different some might say some might say nicer you see the content here again, content here. We have a search bar where that is automatically provided. We can also, we have this button here to view the page source code and can navigate here. And this is how the code block, for example, looks in here. Anything more about that? So Samantha, everyone is back now from the breakout rooms. Okay. Um, I hope you had some time to play around and could make it work on your own computer. Um, Radovan, do you want to continue telling what's going to happen now? Yes. Um, I will take the screen, maybe. Yeah, maybe that's good. And please let us know um, also if that was a nice exercise. And if you had enough time to play around in the Hackamdi. Yeah. So I also wanted to comment a bit on some of these questions and comments. So there were a couple of questions where about restructured text and markdown. So it's possible to have either of the two. 
or even both in, in the same project. And here in the answers, we give some pointers, some examples on how we use it. Also, a couple of questions that came up that, that relate to what we wanted to talk now in the rest of the lesson. We have five minutes left in the official program, and we want to keep this so we will not go over time with the official program. Uh, we, but I think we agreed on a good compromise, and the compromise is that we will wrap up the lesson in the next five minutes, collect feedback. At half past, we will officially close the program because many of you have other obligations. Uh, those of you who then want to listen for 10 more minutes, I will then demonstrate this read doc service. I will make a demo and it will, at, at the minimum, at least it will be in the recording. So you can also watch later the recording. And I want to at least mention these, these next episodes. So what are they about? We have now, we have now created a Sphinx project on our computer and it can generate HTML. In fact, it can also generate PDF and other formats, but it, now the, the, the next question is, well, what do we do with this HTML? Where do we put it? So we could, you could run your own web server, but in fact, this is not necessary. So there are nice alternatives to where to share the HTML for everybody to see. And I want to mention that there are two alternatives, at, at least two. One nice alternative is read the docs. The other alternative is to use GitHub pages, GitLab pages, Bitbucket pages. So either of the two. And let me give you an overview and then later I will make a demo. So what is the read the docs? Read the docs, and here it's linked, read the docs.org. And actually I should zoom in. Read the docs.org. It's a service that hosts public documentation for free. Many projects use this. And I will show that then on stream. So I can deploy, I can tell Redox to build, to run Sphinx build for me. And you can couple it to your Git repository. So every time I will, so my goal is that every time I make a change to my Git repository, every time I push a change, Read the docs should run Sphinx build and it should host, host the documentation for me. And maybe I should show an example, the viewing example. Let me show you some of my example. So this is a project that we've been discussing on stream earlier today. This is some project of mine, which is called Cicero, which is hosted on readthedocs.io. And if I wanted to, I could even have my own domain name and I could use my own domain name and nobody would even know that this is on read the docs. And this is Sphinx. Sphinx generated the HTML every time I modify the GitHub repository. So that's alternative number one. And I will then later demonstrate that. So I'll go through these steps, but the steps are documented here, how you can set it up. And this is what many projects do. The alternative is um, to use, to put your web project on GitHub pages, GitLab pages, Bitbucket pages. In this case, the services host web pages for you. And then you can use GitHub Actions, for instance, or GitLab CI to automatically build it for you. And we will talk about these tomorrow morning when we discuss testing, then we will use these services. But they can also be used not to, not only to test the code, but they can be used to build pages. And this is, this is in fact how we build our lessons and also our website. So th this is built using a GitHub action, which automatically generates um, these lessons for me. So that's why, I don't know if you can read it, but on top of my browser, it says, codefinery.github.io slash documentation. And this is why, because we are now on, oh, we use GitHub pages for that. 
And in the HackMD, I also pasted some link on how we do that really in detail, how we do that automatically. But it's a very nice setup. So now when I, if some, some of you find found finds a mistake in, in the lesson or a typo, you can send us a pull request. Here is the GitHub repository. And once the pull request is accepted, it will automatically rebuild the documentation. I mean, it will rebuild this page for me. So I don't have to really host a web service. I don't have to go anywhere and manually update anything. It will, it will work all automatically. We also have here a summary episode where we compare these tools that we have seen, Markdown or RSD, what are the pros and cons? How about README versus Vitadocs? How about Sphinx compared to GitHub pages? So some food for thought here. I also don't want to forget that at the bottom of the HackMD, we have this feedback. So again, this is one of the most useful things for us to, to learn. One, one aspect that was particularly good today, which we should keep for the future, and the future can be already tomorrow. And one thing that we should improve, change, remove in the future editions of this. So we really appreciate this constructive, positive, and negative feedback. And it's half past. Did I forget anything really important? Maybe the note for tomorrow. Um, I don't have it open right now, but for the testing episode, there was something to prepare. Yes, and we will send it out via email, or we have sent it out. I don't... OK, so. Have we? Um, it has been already part of the last emails, but mm -hmm. it will also be reminded today. So please read that email and prepare for tomorrow. And also, please do not forget about the feedback on our lesson today. Yeah. So feedback, bottom of the page. Anything else to be said? Any practical announcements before we officially close the I think the Zoom part, but or the official part, but I will still continue and make a demo of this Vita Docs. That's not the case. So thanks so much for watching, for listening. Thanks, Anne and Samantha, for co-teaching. Thank you so much for your questions. And officially see you tomorrow. And those of you who have time and would like to see how I try to deploy this to Vita Docs, you can stay for a bit longer. How about I start and show the demo? I will try. So yeah. in, the, in the next 10 minutes, hopefully, my goal is now to deploy a Sphinx project to read the docs and connect it to GitHub. We also have here, in fact, to read the docs, it doesn't matter where the repository is. It can be anywhere. It has to be public. And I could take the same example that we have been we have been building up in the exercise, but to have a fresh start in case anybody got stuck, we have an example, which is this what count project that we have seen yesterday, and we have to use it in the reproducibility lesson. But here we will look at it from the documentation through the documentation lens. So I will take that project, and I want to not fork it, but I want to generate it into my own namespace. And I need to give it a name, and I will call it any name suggestions here. I will call it uh, Sphinx example. Let's see what I hope. Yeah, that's fine. May I will use that this month because I it will be useful for me to have a unique name for later. Just exercising read the docs. It's public. And here I don't fork, but I generate from a template, which means that I will get all the files, but it will flatten the history into one commit. So I will only get one commit, I will not get the whole history. Include all branches, doesn't matter. I 
I will leave it off. Create repository for template. And now it's generating, generating. It generated this repository from the template. And now there is only one commit. So it flattened everything into one commit. It's like a cookie cutter. Some files we recognize from yesterday, the ones that are interesting today is the doc documentation folder. Let's have a look before I go further. Here's the documentation folder. There is conf py, we have seen it before. And there are some RST files. There is an index. And the index will probably reference the other ones. Let's verify. Yeah, so we have seen that before. There is a table of content, and in the table of content, we reference all the other RST files that we want to be part of the documentation. Okay, so I have it on GitHub. What is now the next thing to do? I want to know <clears throat> set it up on read the docs. Okay, now first I should I should clone it. Oh, fine, let's clone it. <coughs> Git clone. I will step in. And I could inspect it here on my on my terminal, but I already did it, did that on GitHub. I can try to build it locally if I want to. Swing's built. Why don't I have Anaconda activated? Because I'm in the wrong window. Here am I, and here it will work. Here I can say Sphinx build. Where is the index? It's in doc. Where do I want the build to end up? For instance, here. And um, now I built it locally. I could preview locally, but we know how to do that already. I want to now go the next step and really put it on read the docs. And on read the docs, so I've done this. I haven't done this. But this is a nice feature. So Sphinx can actually verify all the internal and external links and check them. And it will complain if some links are broken. You can test it out. But now I want How to enable it, know that? it will it will actually check them. So it will visit them. It, so it takes a bit longer to build. Oh, but it will visit all links if they give like four or four page not found. It will uh, give me your error or warning. Can test, test it out. I'm a bit worried that it will detect something, but <laughs> no. Oh, okay. So actually, everything resolves. There is a redirect. So I think something changed from some page moved. It can be also nice to know. And now, next step, I want to enable it on read the docs. Let's visit read the docs. I'll close all these other tabs. And I'm already logged in. And how do I now get that project over to here? Visit your dashboard. Where is my dashboard? Here. That's my dashboard. Here are some of my other projects that are already on Retodox. And I can import a project. That's what I will do. And hmm. Now, what I can connect my account to GitHub, and then it should show me our GitHub repositories. Let's see what happens when I do this. So I have already, okay, there was some problem. That's great. So you can, you will probably not see this error. You can connect your account with GitHub, and then it will show you all the GitHub projects, and you can enable them, import them here into Redox. 
what I can maybe show instead is how to import manually. It's not, there is not much more to it because this can also be useful if you want to import from some other place. So I need to say, what is the name of it? What was the name? Sphinx example may. Sphinx, I can change the name. It should be a unique name. So if I try to use a name that somebody else already took on Redox, it will not let me. What is the repository URL? It's this one, the HTTPS. And it could be anywhere, it doesn't have to be GitHub, but it has to be a publicly clonable repository. Is it a Git repository? Yes, default branch. Yeah, use the default branch. Next. Now I'm getting a complaint here. Is it maybe private repository? It's because I have a, my connection to GitHub for some reason doesn't work, but this is because this account is I created it a long, long time ago before it was even possible to connect to GitHub and I think something got broken. But I, st I still think it will work because I tried it out earlier. Do I need to do something? Project integration, come on. I need to set up this webhook. What is a webhook? A webhook is so now this is ma manual setup on, I need to tell GitHub that every time I push the code, it should inform read the docs that something changed to please rebuild the pages. And I can do this with these webhooks. Hmm. All right, password. Password, here we are. And so that's a manual setup. In, in our instructions, it's easier because normally one doesn't have to go through all these steps. But I need to tell GitHub to, every time it receives a new change, please inform read the docs. And now, now everything should be good and everything should be connected. So first of all, let me verify whether, or whether my documentation is now on. Here, view docs. So it's already here on read the docs. The theme that we see is the Sphinx RTD theme. The address that is here, maybe a tiny, is my project name, .readthedocs.io, slash English, slash latest. So instead of English, I could have a different language. Instead of latest, I could have different branches and tags. Um, and, and if I want, want to, I could also use my, um, my own domain name. So if I own a domain name, I can tell Read the Docs to use my own domain name instead. And that's great, but now I want to see whether the connection between GitHub and Read the Docs is really working. And for this, I will go back to my repository and I want to make a change to it. And I will modify um, the main page, the index page. I'll give it a different title. I want to just want to see whether this is working automatically. So I modify the overview, exit, save, yes. 
git status, git add index, git commit minus m different title. And now let's push it to GitHub git push origin master in this case. GitHub got now the changes on GitHub. So if I reload here, something happened 21 seconds ago. So there is a change. Now GitHub is informing read the docs that something happened. Read the docs, what it will do, it clones the repository and it runs things built. And that's all it does. And if I'm lucky, then a few seconds or minutes later, the change will show up here. Okay, not yet. It will, let's see whether, <laughs> let's look at builds. So that's already encouraging. Something is happening here. So Sphinx figured that it got informed by GitHub. Now it's installing dependencies. It's installing Sphinx and maybe the theme. Let's see what happens there. Yeah, you see that it's, it's cloning the repository. And then it's, do we recognize some of this stuff? Sphinx. Maybe I need to scroll. I was hoping to see Sphinx built somewhere here. Mm. Mm -hmm. Anybody else sees that? Yeah, maybe it's somewhere here is Sphinx built. And now if I go back to my page and reload it, indeed it refreshed automatically. And this is a very nice setup. So every every time I push or well, every time I merge a pull request, a minute later documentation refreshes. I don't need to worry about it. I don't need to host it. It's hosted by this wonderful service. And that's all I wanted to show. And it's automatically really nice and clean. Right. No need to worry about formatting or anything. So what I did was a bit com more complicated version than what we have written here. Um, we also list alternatives. We give hints on how to migrate documentation if, if it's in some, something else, how we would then move it over to Sphinx. And again, reminder that there is also some hints on how to put pages on GitHub pages, if that is, or GitLab pages, Bitbucket pages. That can be a nice alternative. Some projects use use both. And in the summary episode, we also discuss when the one can be more interesting or the other or both. Good. I think we can then stop the stream and recording. Thanks so much for watching. And looking forward to tomorrow.